Dear colleague, welcome to the third part on how to write your first scientific paper. And here we will discuss collaboration and communication and questions of a more political nature. So in the end of the last presentation, you submitted your paper, but unfortunately, it is quite possible that the journal will not accept your paper, in which case you choose a new journal, adapt the manuscript according to that journal, and submit again. However, I am sure that your paper will be so good that it is accepted, but probably it will not be accepted without some comments from the reviewers and suggestions for revisions. When you receive this, create a response letter to the reviewers. The reviewers are trying to help you to improve your manuscript, so remember to express your gratitude and thank each reviewer for their help, and always keep a polite tone. Quote exactly each sentence of the reviewer that contains a query before answering that query. You may start with answer and use bold text or something similar. Start with the simple questions and save the difficult to last. And keep your answers concise and short. The questions, comments and suggestions from the reviewers will normally result in a need for a revision of the manuscript. Create a revised version of the manuscript where you highlight the changes done manually or by using track changes in Word. Whether or not your manuscript will be accepted depends on the reviewers, so try to humor them. Follow their advice when possible, and I suggest that you accept also to make changes that you are not very happy to do as long as they do not have a clear negative impact on the quality of the manuscript. When you can't or you don't want to follow the reviewer's suggestion, then try to meet them halfway if possible and explain in a clear and scientific manner why you are not following their advice. Sometimes the reviewer will quote something from a paper to make a point in the critique of your paper. Then you must read the reference and see if the reviewer is right or not in the quotation. If not right, it is easy to show that. If right and contrary to your well-founded claim, then try to find other papers that contradict the reviewer's reference, showing that this is not a mathematical issue and several opinions may exist. It is unusual, but occasionally you might encounter the peer reviewer who is not a peer and ignorant regarding the topic of interest, and who might come with completely incorrect statements. In such cases, keep your calm, be nice, and start with something like with all due respect, we beg to disagree, and give your scholarly referenced arguments. Grace and elegance are the key in such situations, and my colleague and mentor Marwan Haris, who spent many years in London, has kindly provided an encryptation key that you might find useful if you are not a native English speaker. Unfortunately, the reviewers are not always in agreement with each other and might suggest you to move in completely opposite directions. If this is the case, then in your reply, refer reviewer A's statement to reviewer B's statement and try to reconcile between the two, insisting on the version that you are more confident with, with scientific arguments and indicate the discrepancy between reviewers to the editor in your cover letter. If you're writing your first papers, then it is likely that you have a supervisor, mentor or senior colleague and a few other co-authors. So answer the questions and make the revisions that you can, and then seek to help and advice of the, your supervisor. The questions of with whom to communicate and when is of course relevant also when you write a manuscript. So let's take a step back in time and look at that. Concerning how to communicate with your supervisor, this is only my preferences and how I do it with my junior colleagues when they are writing their first papers. Write the paper in sections, as discussed above. Regarding minor questions arising during the writing, it is often easiest and fastest to contact me immediately. When you have finished a section and you consider that you have done it as good as you can, then it is time to send it to me. Do not send a section which you consider that you might improve further. And I want only the current section and sections that were previously finished, not any preliminary parts of sections that will be dealt with later. However, when I say that you should make everything as good as you can before sending it on, 
then you of course need to use your own judgment and don't spend weeks trying to perfect a detail of minor importance. Most often I will make corrections, alterations in the text, either using bold text or overcrossing, or the tracking device in Word. I will write comments in the text or in the margins. Before sending the revised manuscript back to me, remove all of these corrections and comments after you have implemented them. Do not reply to my comments if there are no problems, just implement them directly in the text. And you should not use the tracking device. I don't want to see exactly what you have done, but the finished result. And you can add comments and questions when you want, preferably in the margins. Regarding your other co-authors, don't disturb them more than necessary. If you're working with something where they are directly involved, then you should of course include them in the communication. However, if you have one person who helped you with gathering of the clinical data, and another who did the statistics, then do not bother them when you're writing the introduction. Believe me, your colleagues don't want you to disturb them once a week with a new version of the manuscript. Send the latest version only to your supervisor and to any person who is really involved in the section that you are currently working on. If you are unsure, ask your supervisor for advice. When you and your supervisor have done what you can and you deem that you have a complete and decent manuscript, then you send it to all co-authors for the final round or rounds. If you have many co-authors on a paper, then it might be a good idea to have a clear preliminary deadline when you intend to submit your manuscript if they don't respond or do not have any major comments. Most colleagues are reasonable and easy to work with, but there are exceptions, and the order of names in the author list can occasionally arouse strong emotions and even conflicts. If you believe that this might be an issue, then my advice is to decide this as early as possible, preferably already when inviting a person to collaborate on a paper and preferably to suggest the expected contributions from each one as well as the preliminary author list in an email to everyone involved. An email which you should then save in case of any future discussion. Things may, of course, change during the work with the paper, and some will therefore be of the opinion that the order of authors can only be decided in the end, when you know how much each one has actually contributed, and this is of course a valid point. Basically, people should be ordered according to their contribution and people who has not been contributing to the scientific work should not be included as authors. If someone has contributed with non-scientific work, then thank them in the acknowledgments, but do not include them in the author list. In the author list, the first and last names are the most prestigious. The first name belongs to the main author who has done most of the work with writing the paper and the last name to the senior author with the overall responsibility. Note that for an established scientist, both these names are of more or less equal value, while for a junior researcher writing his first papers, the last position will actually be the least prestigious position, indicating that the author has contributed very little to the paper. The second name is also somewhat prestigious and goes to the author who has contributed the most after the first author, and the same might be the case regarding the second name from the end, but this is not always the case. Sometimes you will see an asterisk after the first and second name with the phrase both authors have contributed equally. This is an attempt of sharing the value of the first position equally and is mainly of importance at a local level, such as when two PhD students are both including the same paper in the respective thesis. More rarely, you will see the same regarding the two last names. Regarding the names in between, these should be arranged in descending order of contribution, but does in reality differ little in value. The corresponding author is the author who will manage the correspondence with the journal and whose contact information will appear in the published paper in case the readers have any questions. Some people consider this to be somewhat prestigious. My personal opinion is that the first author who has written the paper should be the corresponding author, but that exceptions from this might be made when the first author is very junior and cannot be expected to manage the questions or discussions that might arise. Sometimes I see that people are reluctant to invite others to collaborate on a paper, but remember that if you are the first author, 
adding one or two extra co-authors in the middle will not in any manner reduce the value of your contribution. Further, this is a good way to extend your network, so consider to invite people that you believe might have something to contribute. And if they fail in the end to reciprocate and never invite you, then just move on and invite someone else the next time. Likewise, if you happen to find envious or quarrelsome people among your collaborators, then learn your lesson and avoid inviting them in the future. And if you would like to learn more about how your publications are measured and ranked, then have a look at this lecture concerning the age index. An important question is if you should only write good papers. Today the phrase publish or perish is becoming all too true, and I realize that there might be other reasons than advancing science driving you towards publishing. However, I would like to suggest that you avoid publishing poor materials. If you have to, then at least write as well as you can, even if the material is poor. And never divide a material which would have resulted in one good paper into two poor papers. Poor papers are making it more difficult to find the good and important papers and is wasting the time of reviewers and readers. Thus, to willingly produce papers of a poor quality is contrary to the value of science and a lack of respect towards your colleagues. And most importantly, to write poor papers will steal your time and distract you from creating great papers. And with that I end this presentation, and remember that you will find 250 more lectures at the Stereotactic Academy at stereotactic.org. Thank you for your attention.